Happy Valentine's Day, Heel Squad. No, it's not Maria Menounos. As you can see, I think down there in the lower third, as we call it in show business, it's Mr. Maria Menounos. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Uh, I guess we're just going to start off with the quote of the day. I think that's how they do things today. I think the problem is we depend on lovers to love us the way we should love ourselves. That is from life coach and relationship expert Mark Groves, who is going to be with us today to give us all the information we need on um, being single or whether you're in a relationship and how to keep that going. If you're in a relationship and maybe you're a parent, how you can keep that going. We talk about uh, situationships. Situationships. Thank you, Kelsey Alexandra Meyer, my illustrious executive producer and co-host. Um, and uh, as well as some love rituals that you can practice to uh, to keep your relationship um, on track, as they say. So without further ado, Kelsey, why don't you tell us a little bit about our guest? So we love Mark. Mark has been on the show before. He is a Heal Squad alum. He's a human connection specialist and the founder of Create the Love, a platform helping users create the life and love they've always wanted. He's a writer, a speaker, a coach, an emotional translator who helps our heart make hearts make sense. He empowers people to give words to their feelings, step into courage and create the love and life they'll look back on with a resounding hell yes. I'm so excited for Mark. You guys are going to be so obsessed with this chat. It's really good. Kevin, you killed it. I'm grateful. And it's very exciting. Now, listen, before we do that, if you would be so kind as to give some mercy, five-star rating (laughs) on Apple podcasts, along with a review, uh, we would be very grateful and continue to tell your friends. We work really hard every day on Heal Squad to provide you with uh, information and tools to help you with your lives. I think we succeed at that. It seems as though we do with the comments, the letters, the emails, and the um, comments we receive. We want to be able to keep doing that. We do it every day here. We're a daily podcast. Sometimes we even go six days a week uh, incredibly. And uh, the best way you can pay us back is by doing that, is by... Uh, you know, giving us that five-star review, a nice rating, uh, a nice uh, five-star rating and a nice review. And if you can tell friends about us, then that would be nice. And then, you know what? If you want to come over to Patreon, then you get all this commercial free and you get our special heal events where we have world-class healers work with you intimately. And uh, we've had incredible breakthroughs on those as well. So anyway, that being said, without further ado, I do have one more thing to say. Oh, one more one thing more on this thing. Valentine's day on this Valentine's day. If you guys are needing a last minute gift for your, your Galentine, your boo yourself, Maria mm-hmm. has her Macy's page. That's specially curated. We have some really fun Valentine's day stuff on there. So it's oh. Macy's.com backslash heel squad. Check it out. And like I said, if you want to just buy yourself a Valentine's Day gift, her favorite new cream bronzer from Anastasia Beverly Hills is on there. And yeah, so there's some fun stuff. Yeah, but by the way, I like that. I like buying stuff for yourself. Me too. On these days. Like, you know what? Buy your own flowers. Buy your own presents. You know what? Do that for yourself. Um, Yeah, heart going out to everyone on this Valentine's Day. Um, But yeah, and if you don't have that significant other you've got friends and other it's, it's just and about you love got us. you got us yes of course but you got you so boom go buy yourself something nice kelsey let's see how spontaneous you can be blue tongues on one three two one mark thank you for doing this and uh it's god it's always every time you know a lot of the guests on our show but especially you i was like i love doing the research because i'm like oh my god oh my god Aha uh-huh moment, aha uh-huh moment. <laughs> so I'm really excited cool. to be here. Thanks for having yeah. me. Mark, happy Valentine's Day. Very, very big day for uh, for Hallmark. <laughs> no, for the country. It's, yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Big day yeah. for Hallmark today. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. Can we talk the positive and the negative sides of, 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 of quote, the this day? Because I see a lot of people put a lot of undue pressure on themselves, our relationships put pressure on themselves. But then I also see it, there is a time you can recognize people and say, hey, I love you. So I'm a, I'm a little on the fence about Valentine's Day. But I'd like yeah, to hear I the Mark Rose perspective. 
Yeah, I, I feel similarly in that, you know, I think it's a great day to remind us to uh, cherish what we have, to express gratitude, to express love, to celebrate it. And then maybe just in the the happening of that, we actually realize we should be doing that all the time. You know, in research, it's not about big moments. Like relationship success isn't about anniversaries or birthdays or Valentine's Day or whatever. It's about actually the micro moments, the moments between, you know, the way that we interact uh, in the morning, you know, like just subtle things that seem to be maybe what we might perceive in passing or actually it's, you know, it's like the small things build to the big things, just like the small shifts build to big shifts. So, yeah, I'm a little mixed on it. And hey, if love deserves a, a one day of massive celebration, that's great. I think the other side, though, of Valentine's Day is that often people who are alone or single, then they experience, you know, more loneliness. It's more amplified. And uh, that that's something I think needs to be confronted too, because it's bringing forward that probably in some way we're placing our value in our relationship status, which we so often do. Oh, wow. So I'll have to just unpack with what you just said. Um, can we talk about those micro wins? Because I think you're right. We, we, we save it all for the anniversary yeah. Or the birthday or Valentine's Day or, you know, and talk about how, because I know with you, you back your stuff up with a lot of science and data. But, um, yeah, let's go over the difference between the mac that macro kind of celebration or salute to the positive things versus mm -hmm. the, the little micro ones you're talking about. Well, yeah, you know, if you're constantly celebrating each other, and I don't mean so over the top that it's it's not genuine anymore, uh, then it sort of insulates you. You're like, Rick, if you're only celebrating an anniversary or only celebrating a birthday, if you miss that, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. But if you're constantly in the space of gratitude and appreciation, then it, it insulates relationships from bigger challenges. So what I mean by that, let's give an example of what like a micro moment would be like. In the research from the Gottmans, they call them bids. And what they see is that they, they studied couples, they uh, newlyweds, they put them in a little apartment overlooking uh, Lake Washington. They call it the Love Lab and they recorded their conversations. And then they followed up with them six years later. And what they saw was that they could predict whether a couple would divorce based on how they responded to bids. And there's a, quite a bit of research that they've done on this. Um, but what they looked at was that, you know, for example, when I was a kid, I remember my parents, when we were sitting around the breakfast table, my dad would often read the paper and be like, you just hear him go, huh? And my mom would respond to that by saying, oh, what are you reading? You know, and so he's really trying, that is a bid, the huh is a bid to be, you know, for there to be curiosity and inquiry. Now, in relationships that are successful, couples turn, I believe it's to uh, something like eight, more than 87% of bids. For couples that don't, uh, that don't make it, uh, they turn towards around 35 or 37%, I forget the number, but much lower, like dramatically lower. And so it's just these little things like the you know, making that sound that's saying like, ask me a question or in the morning, just like smiling at each other and asking, how's your morning going? You know, I love you. Just these little things that we stop doing often, but relationship yeah. masters don't stop doing them. They keep doing them. I think is it's hard to, I think with children and other responsibilities, I see that happen a lot where, especially the parents in the last 25 years get so focused on the children and their needs that they put that stuff aside, the appreciation mm -hmm. for each other. Do you see that a lot too? Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm about to have a baby. So I'll let you, I'll uh, come back. So with, am I. So, <laughs> all right. Congrats. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we'll be able to circle back around this in a little yeah. bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one thing that happens when a couple becomes a family is there's a transition from two to three or four. And, uh, you know, what it, the identity of the relationship changes. And so there is a mourning, a grieving that has to happen as you move into the exciting phase of becoming a family. So there's that aspect. And I think you're really right. You know, so much of 
a person's capacity, especially a mother in that early part gets taken up by the needs of the child and not taken up in a bad way in a necessary survival attachment way. But we have to be so mindful. Like my partner and I, Kylie and I, we are constantly talking about how we approach that, that we bring that top of mind. Because the other thing that happens is that for the mother, touch becomes associated with need. So constantly have a child needing milk, needing, you know, love, connection. Then when the partner goes to touch for intimacy and connection, it can feel associated with more needs. And so there can be mm. sort of a repelling of it. Yeah. So yeah, these right. are wow. We have to talk about these things because they're happening anyways. So when we bring them forward and into the surface, then as a couple, you can actually discuss how do we approach this? How do I bring my needs to you in a way that feels like they're not a burden? And how do I support you so that you feel like you want to move in my direction? I think having that awareness. So that really, again, just really helps having that knowledge of what you just said to the forefront. Like this is what's going to happen. So if both partners are aware of that, I think that that you're halfway to, you know, being able to cope with it a lot better. And I never heard that before. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, like with Kylie and I, we did a uh, initiatory sort of celebration where we lit a fire and then we wrote down all the things we were afraid of and everything we were excited about. And then we took those pieces of paper that we wrote on, we shared if we wanted to with one another and we then burned them. And then we set up these, all we had where we were, were these two plants and we set up and we walked through them because that was representative of being a threshold of like moving through from being couple to then family. And, you know, I think these types of rituals are important. You know, ritual has been part of human uh, groups for <laughs> I mean, since the dawn of them, and we don't often have these rituals that really uh, delineate these moments in our life. You know, much like marriage is a ritual, uh, we don't do these ones that are actually about transitions. Right. We do, we'll do um, baby showers and reveals. Yeah. And by the way, and someone explained to me why I was being a total dude mark this weekend because someone was like, oh, you're going to have all the showers. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and he's and 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 this guy said, and um, it's actually a famous actor, but it was beautiful. He said, no, 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 that stuff, don't be like that. That's you, you all love. It's people giving you love and giving love to the baby and love to your wife. And and I was like, wow, I never thought of it that way. But backing up, um, again, like those, we go back to the major birthday, the major anniversary, the major um you know, reveal party, major shower. These are the major rituals, but it seems like what you created was a micro one that I've never heard. So we're not really aware of those. Can we talk about some of those? I'm yeah. calling them micro, micro love rituals, if that's even what it is. But I find that fascinating. I think, I think just it, even just to bring again, brings that awareness of we're doing this ritual for this reason. It just kind of put something in the back of your head as a reminder or a go-to as the relationship progresses. But can we talk about more of these? Cause I've, I've never heard that before. And I, I, I'm really, that feels right to me. Yeah. You know, there's a, it, it really treats the relationship as sacred. And I think that Whoa. really for relationships, romantic relationships to succeed, we have to have at the baseline of how we interact a uh, dedication to reverence for one another, treating it as sacred. Because the connection between you and your partner, for, between me and my wife, is sacred. And if I see it as such, then I'm going to behave in a way that honors it. And so it, it, the one that we did is really about there being a, a process for us that's separate from a group celebrating us, that's really just between us, that there's a deeper level of intimacy and understanding of what we're both going through. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was, it was, it brought up a lot of emotion because, you know, you, you grieve how many beautiful memories you've had and you're excited about having a child. But of course there's a difference in terms of where you can go, your liberate, you know, sort of the freedoms and all that kind of stuff. 
I mean, your life does change from what I hear <laughs> dramatically. Again, we can, we'll check in so, after. So, so your ritual, just to define it, this particular ritual, it was your transition from it's just about us to now our relationship is going to be about we're bringing in a third party, we're bringing yeah. in a child and another, and the relationship is going to transition. And so for you, what were, if it's not too personal, what were some of the things you wrote down to burn? Or yeah. just if you give me examples, I think that'll help people. Well, some of the fears were things like, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> that I'll fail my child, that I'll f I, I won't know how to show up properly for my child because I've never been a dad. Yeah. Um, some of the other fears were um, that it'll be a lot to hold, that I won't know how to hold uh, work and that and, and all the things, that I won't know how to show up for her, for, for my wife. Um, you know, things that cognitively i'm like oh, i'll be able to figure all that out but just being able to label label the fears that i have uh, because there's so much unknown in moving through that threshold once the baby comes into the world uh fears of the health of the baby fears of and things i was excited about having a child excited about bringing so a it's not just fear you're writing down it's yeah. fears and it's things you're excited about so is it just your emotions that that you're yeah. writing down yeah yeah, mainly just things you're afraid of and things that you're pumped about. And and you said you burned them afterwards, but do you, do you exchange them with one another? Yeah, yeah, we shared them with each other. Okay. Uh, other fears were that we wouldn't have time for each other anymore, or we'd take one another for granted that right. we'd um, we we wouldn't be as invested in our relationship. Just things that really live in that space of unknown. You know, I don't know what it's like to have a baby and businesses, you know? So how do you create the space for all of that? I'm sure I can figure it out, but yeah, just be that way you are both have a window into each other's experience. You know, it deepens intimacy, vulnerability. We also did separately, instead of a baby uh, shower, we did a parent blessing. So it was about us, like blessing us as parents, which, you know, inevitably also blesses the child. And then individually, I did a father blessing and she did a mother blessing. And that was about her being surrounded by women that um, she wanted to be celebrated and, and hear their advice. And they all brought, you know, I did the same with, uh, with friends, with my men's group. And, you know, what did they hope for me? What was advice they had for me as an upcoming father? And those were just her with her friends, me with my friends at a separate time. When let's, this is great for pa parents, by the way, people who are brought to be parents. Let's uh, let's step back to the people who are dating. You know, yeah. they're, they're with someone, and you know, they they think this is going to be the person. Um, what advice? What rituals would could you recommend for them, or could you? Yeah, you know, there was this great. Uh, I forget what book it was from, but a friend of mine told me about it, and it was that. They suggested in this book that every week you check in with your partner. Let's say you have a ritual on your Sunday dinner or Sunday brunch or something. Um, and every week you have a ritual with them where you ask them to grade you from one to 10 on how you're doing as a partner. <laughs> and yeah, it's kind of funny because you know what it would turn into is let's say you got a seven or a four or whatever it is. A lot of the times we get defensive about something like that. Oh, you're a seven. Yeah, I and, would be. <laughs> Right. And then we're like yeah. seven. I am not a seven. But what this does is you then can say, well, what would have made me a 10 last week? And you start to garner really valuable information. You get to constantly check in. You know, I think one thing about committed relationships is that we often take them for granted. We stop checking in. We stop seeing, you know, when we get married, uh, you think of the previous vows that people express, like till death do us part, honor and obey, you know, and what happens is, is that when we enter commitments like that, we think that the, the person then can't leave. And then because we think they can't leave, then we don't have to show up as much. And so the early part of the dating process, Dr. Uh, Stan Tacken, who's a famous psychologist, he talks about how the real reason that relationships end is because we fail to create agreements at the beginning, to be clear about our agreements. How are we going to be? What are our values in this relationship? You know, how are we going to show up? How will we handle conflict? 
and just being so proactive with that. So if you're dating, be proactive about the agreements you're creating. Like if you're afraid to ask what's going on between you and the other person or where, what the relationship status is, then you start to create a relationship that is afraid of confronting truth. You know, a lot of us are afraid to confront the truth in relationships. And we learned that probably from our childhoods because we existed in families that didn't talk about dad who's an alcoholic or mom who's a narcissist or the person who has anger issues or the troublemaking brother or sister or whatever it is. Even if a person in a family has a chronic illness, you know, the family tends to oscillate around that person. And we don't talk about other people's needs not being met in that because we feel guilty. So there's lots of things that can shape but look at our society. We don't tend to confront the truth. And so we have all these adaptive strategies. And so when we enter a relationship and we're afraid of saying how we feel or what we really want, what ends up happening is we're creating the bedrock for a relationship that is not actually doesn't have space for our needs, that it survives by us silencing ourselves and not expressing ourselves. And then ultimately we end up feeling resentful. So from a dating process, you have to be very proactive in those things. Um, so I know Kelsey, the big thing with the, uh, you know, Kelsey's millennial, like close to Gen Z, but the big thing is, is situationships. Kelsey, is this the, this is the, the new right. <laughs> Mark, are you familiar with this? And if so, can, yeah, can I mean, help? I've dabbled in a, you know, my share of situationships in my previous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe I have too. I don't know. I just don't know what it is. I'm sure you have. Kev. Mark will explain, but yeah, it's like, I feel like a very hot topic with my age, but even I was saying to Kevin, I was talking to a woman the other day, Maria and I were at an event. She was asking what we were doing for a Valentine's Day episode. And I said, you were coming on. And she said, gosh, you guys have to talk about situationships. They're so hard. So I want you to go into it, Mark. Oh. But yeah, I think mm -hmm. that it pertains to everybody. We all deal with these like sort of situationshipy things. Yeah. I mean, how would you define it? A situationship is essentially like friends with benefits, you know? And Kelsey, you can always uh, chime in if you think there's uh, more descriptors no, that right. are required. It's just but like it, yeah, that, someone not wanting like, to commit. Yeah. I don't want to yeah. be in a relationship with you, but I want to be intimate with you. Right. And so maybe we Netflix and chill, but I don't want to deal with your emotional needs. The yeah. Okay. There's a lot to unpack here. You just want to focus on the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. Is that a bad I, thing? He doesn't. I get that. Right. Like if you could get a BJ and not have to talk about feelings, oh I mean, my God. Right? <laughs> like, if you're emotionally unavailable, that sounds like a pretty good setup. So right. I would say that situationships tend to be uh, ways that we create limits on depth and intimacy and emotional vulnerability. So a lot of the times, and I'd say this is almost always, because people don't tend to communicate really truthfully their boundaries and their needs in situationships, like a lot of the times people end up in situationships because they want relationships, but they end up meeting somebody they have a connection with and the person doesn't want more. So the other person says, I don't want more either, but truly they do want yes. more. And they think that if they bang this person on demand or give them a great hand job or, you know, whatever it is, that that person will want to be in a relationship with them. They'll be able to convince them to change what they want. There's so many layers to this in that first, it's we don't actually trust that we can ask for what we want. We're afraid to let go of this situationship. But here's the irony of all this. If people who were in situationships who really wanted relationships actually left those situationships, they would find relationships but they end up using all their time and resources and emotional energy to invest in someone who doesn't want to invest in them. And so it is generally a childhood wound of unavailability that is expressing itself in what we desire as adults in relationship. And I would say when you end up in relationship with people who just don't really want to choose you fully, uh, then you have to develop the belief that you're not worthy of being chosen fully. Like you can't be in a situation when you really want a relationship and believe you're worthy of more than that because you're actually choosing something that says, N I don't believe it. And so it's, uh, I'd say there's also a lot of fear of intimacy and closeness, truthfully, maybe in younger generations. 
Um, there's probably a lot to do with technology there, availability, the paradox of choice. Like there's more choice than there's ever been. And, you know, there's a lot of people who would say that creating too much sexual availability uh, also devalues like how a mate is perceived. And when I say mate, I mean like from a biological perspective. So there's lots to unpack here, Kev. How many grenades? I know, but no, I'm sorry. I, this is very helpful because I think I see a lot of single people. So, I mean, we covered relationships to a point, but I I guess Valentine's Day, for me, I, I'm, I don't know, I want to focus. I feel like it hurts more single people than it does people in relationships. So yeah, there's many, uh, there's other, I would love to do more parts with you and hopefully we can on just general relationships. And, but I think it's the single friends I have who dread this day the most. And this is where I have to buy the most amount of flowers <laughs> for my single friends, because <laughs> I know what they're going through. I feel so bad, but a lot of them are younger. And I think especially the swipe right culture. So it is a lot to unpack, but we got to unpack it. Let's unpack it. I mean, you know, and Kelsey, you don't have to go off. away because you can come back in. <laughs> I, just, you know, I'm like, yeah. I mean, Carolina, first of all, I have to say, yes, I want to talk about that. But Carolina and I are sitting here going, that is the best definition of a situation ship I've ever heard in my life. And I think so many of those things like we know, but we just don't know what yeah, work to do. That's let's let's go. Mark let's knows go. what to do. Yeah. Mark yeah. knows what Got to this. do. No, watch this. Mark, tell him well, what to do. <laughs> well, I'd say the first part is really seeing that, you know, we're talking about this swipe right culture, which, yeah, oh man, there's a lot of, I like the layers that, that come into this. Um, let's look at it from just a purely evolutionary perspective. So first off, there's a lot higher cost to intimacy to women. And the reason is they can get pregnant. And so they need to have a mate that is available for at least 40 weeks after intimacy. So when you look at the hormones that are released during sex, it's generally mainly oxytocin. Oxytocin is a connective hormone. It's released during orgasm, breastfeeding, things like that. And oxytocin lasts longer in women than it does in men. And so the half-life, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's the interaction with hormones like testosterone versus estrogen. So that's why after a one night stand, what might be experienced as women having more connection or more desire to maintain connection. You know, interestingly, uh, there's a sort of cultural narrative that men want to spread their seed and women want commitment. In the research, it's shown that women get bored of monogamy faster than men. So a lot of these things that I think are just, yeah. So a lot of these are just cultural narratives that have supported, I would say the behavior of men and, Supported you know, and look- probably promoted and enhanced. And you know what I mean? If a, if a man hears that or he he's going to be more apt to behave that way. And if a woman, right. he, woman hears that she's, you know, ha- she's always the monogamous one, there's pressure from society. Well, of course, I'm going to fit in and be. But that right. is fast. Do you believe, by the way, so that is actual statistics that, that the woman. Yeah, I forget has- what that study's from, but I remember when I read it, I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting because it challenges all the narratives that we have. Um, so when you I look mean, at that. I can see why, because they carry with the kids and the this and the that. If I could think of anyone who wants to be like, you know what? I just want to head out the back door, you know, right. for a minute. Right, I, right I where a guy's world. going to work and he's, he's mm-hmm. in general, I'm saying, I'm like, there, with me and Maria talk about this all the time. It's funny because some when Maria goes to comedy and sometimes her comedy is so poignant that she can't really show it. So then I tattle on her. But she was like, you know what? <laughs> with guys, she said, like, Kevin, with guys, it's like with us, we have to worry about everything. We're worried about the kids, the health, the parents' health, the this, the that, is the, you know, is there mold in the house? You know, we're, He's, and for you, you guys, you go out and you work, and your big thing is you're good on the grill. Yeah. Right? The average guy <laughs> is just good on the grill, and he's the hero. And that's, that's like, not un- right? It, right? Isn't that hilarious? I'm like, oh my God, Maria, that's so true. And so, n- not good that it's true. But, I, and now with women having to work and provide on top of all that, I can see why they would be like, you know what? Peace the F out. But I think society, <laughs> has shamed them so much that they 
you know, they kind of stay in line more and we're the ones who will, you know, get into the less ethical. It seems again, and I'm not, I'm just going off regular guy instinct. That's really yeah. blows me away though. And that, but it does make sense. Yeah. So in, when you look at uh, Harriet Lerner talks about how, why is it that women tend to want to learn about relationships more than men? And she said, it's because any subordinate group has to learn the needs and nuances yeah. of the dominant group. And so if women wow. didn't know how to navigate male emotion, they can die, right? They can get killed. They can be assaulted. So that's why there tends to be more emotional fluency in women and why, you know, if I run an event, it's like 85% women generally. Um, so there's that. So there's, when you think about that, how that might translate to situationships is that a woman might acquiesce to just being in a situationship because they don't have space for their needs, or they might've look up their matrilineal line and see that there hasn't been space for their mother's needs, their grandmother's needs, their great grandma, right? So they've never actually seen a relationship that had space for both people's needs. Now, on the other side of that, uh, what you're talking about where, women tend to sort of carry all the plates. That is what uh, might be called over-functioning. So they're doing all these things, carrying the world, and that gives permission to whoever they're in relationship with, no matter the gender, because you'll see this combination, no matter gender. To be uh, good at smoking person, meats. Yeah. Right. The other person under-functions. And so you might right. see, I mean, if only smoking meats could get us through it all, but it can't. Right. Uh, so what happens is this is kind of like where a partner's trying to get the other person to listen to a podcast, read a book, go to therapy. They're booking all the calendar stuff for them to, they're booking their therapy appointment. And if they stop doing all that, their fear is that the world would fall apart. But actually what will happen is it will create space because that's a childlike overfunctioning. I'm doing more than I should. And it creates space for the other person to finally step in and show up. Wow. Everyone, uh, our fan base, the Heal Squad needs to hear that Be because they're afraid to stop doing everything because they think everything's going to collapse. And what they don't realize is it will create space. It's actually a good thing. It'll empower other people. It'll make them live longer. It's the hardest thing though, because that initial point of when you do take your hands off the wheel, right? The ship goes out of control yeah, and your is. instinct is I got to put my hands back on the wheel. But if you can ride it out, it, yeah, you're creating space for the other person to grow and for everyone in the family to grow. Well, yeah, you're expressing boundaries and you're also, this won't be a popular thought, but I'm going to say it. You're also having to step out of the space of martyr you know, out of the space of victim, yeah. because what happens when you carry all the plates is you get to tell everybody how many you plates you carry and you get to also hold that over people. And anyone who exists in that space, all you do is ask them, do you resent? Is there resentment present? And almost always they'll say yes, unless they just don't want to admit it. And resentment is a hundred percent of the time present when you don't prioritize yourself over something or someone. And so we use resentment often as a way to weaponize, like use as power. But if we sourced our power instead of from being a martyr, which I'm not, when I say victim or martyr, I'm not negating the experience of what might create that space, but I'm saying we can't live in it. And so when we start to step out of that from sourcing our power from being the martyr and step into it by actually just being powerful, by expressing our needs, wants, and desires and boundaries, what happens is, it, you know, it's very similar to being in a relationship with an addict. You can't tell the, you could say, I'd like you to quit whatever you're doing. But generally the way that an addict ends up quitting is because there's an intervention of people who love them who say, I will no longer support over function, I will no longer support your addiction. And so here's the tricky the, part. It's here's the same behavior. Part, Mark. Here's the tricky it, part. Yeah. When absolutely. you are, and by the way, you've just totally described of I know we're all multifaceted. You've described one part of me, you know, where I've I've done I've done all the over functioning in our relationship and in everyone around me. And have it's been very convenient to be a victim and to be a martyr. It's been great to have that to fall back on. That's what gives me power. I'll, everything you're saying, I get. I think the problem is the people around you are going to be less incentivized to intervene because they're reaping all the benefits of everything right. you're doing. So it's really up to the martyr. 
on the one hand say, okay, yes, I'm doing everything and I'm amazing for doing everything, but I am doing this by choice. There is something selfish attached to this for me. And I'm getting, I'm getting to be the victim. Like you said, I'm getting to have this kind of power in my, my own way that I've carved out where everyone needs me. Um, so I think it comes down to that individual who then says, I need to know you, what you said was brilliant about you. I need to address what my, my true needs are and then address those. And by doing so, I'm going to get better and we're all going to get better. But I think it's the tricky thing with an alcoholic or a drug addict. They're making such a mess um, mm -hmm. that you've got all the loved ones are going to come in and go, come on, you got to stop, man. You're going to die. You're going to. But I see, I know, and I don't know if you know the mark, but I have a dad and I have a mother-in-law in particular who were the types that were the martyrs and everyone was happy to just suck off their energies till they died young. Yeah. And I see yeah, that absolutely. a lot. So my thing is it's, it's kind of up to the, in this situation, in this addiction cycle, it's more up to the addict to look in the mirror and go, you know what? Like, I don't, I, it's, it's hard because it, it's hard because you've got to admit that there is a, there is a selfish side to it. There is a, yeah, it's a not, key. you're not a hero. You're not the hero you think you are. Let me say that you are, I'm sure for most of the things you're doing, but you're not the hero you think you are that you're definitely doing it for a reason. And I, I thank you, Mark, for sharing that because you just enlighten me. I think I'm in the place right now where I'm just starting to say what my needs are. And it's hard yeah. because the other person's like, Whoa, 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 wait, what you're, you have but, needs. Yeah, well, yeah, like because you've been twenty years of behaving in a certain way. Yeah, but it is never too late to do it, and so it's been. Um, yeah, wow, you just you really just you gave me a lot there. Uh, I don't know why Kelsey jumped off because this is all. Yeah, get back <laughs> because here. you two were having a moment. No, we need you in this moment. I, okay. I just was having my moment. No, I love Kelsey. It. I feel like I'm the older version. You could definitely go down this road. Um, oh, what, what, okay. So what can we do? Well, so yeah, let's, let's go, unpack. Yeah. That. What can we do if we're ed entering into the situation where, where the type of person out, and I know this is very, I don't know what the rest of the country is like. I can only really speak to LA, but we are the city of opportunity, opportunity and opportunists. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's only gotten worse, but it's, it's so it's with technology. It was always swipe right in a different way, but now it's, and yeah. so you're getting a constant Netflix and chill vibe or invite. And I can see where it makes perfect sense. Well, you'll say, yeah, yeah, I want a Netflix and chill too. But really you're thinking you can do it long enough to get the person over to your side of, of true intimacy and yeah, commitment. Exactly. So it's, what do we It's a do? similar what, pattern. What are the signs we can see maybe to see in the other person that, this isn't going right. Or what, what, is there work we can do on ourselves to attract the person that yeah. is really does want the commitment? Like help me there. Okay. Remind me to come back to that because first I just want to unpack the pattern that you're talking about. It won't okay. take long, but the no, pattern no, please. of where you said that generally when there's a bunch of takers around a giver, it's not like the takers are going to be like, we get a lot of stuff from you. We'd really like you to stop giving so much. What happens is, is that when people exist in relationship, taking care of everyone else's needs, it's usually because they grew up taking care of other people's needs. There just wasn't space for them to develop them there to individuate in, in their childhood. And so maybe the, we pivoted around the needs of a parent or the parents weren't even around. So we didn't develop like the way to express it because no one would hear it. So as adults, one of the values that we get from it is by giving and taking care of everyone, you need me. So now you can't leave me. So there's, yes. a, I'm, it creates an unconscious codependent yep. hook. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the other person isn't also hooking in by taking and by needing to be supported, right? There's, a, there, it's a mutual wounding pattern that each other, we find each other specifically because we wound each other in the very ways we are familiar with. And so the invitation out is often when someone's in a circumstance like you're talking about, and I very much relate to your circumstances, sounds like Kelsey does too, is that we don't trust that a relationship will stay together if it has space for us. And if someone asks someone in that pattern, 
what do you need and what do you want? They often don't even know how to label it because no, they're no. such experts at other people's needs and wants. Yes. So there's a growing up that occurs within our hearts and souls, which is becoming, it's really about becoming adults, which is also why the over, the under functioner needs to become an adult and handle their business too. So your healing is actually the other person's healing. And so the relationship, you know, I was talking to a mentor of mine who is like talking to Kylie and I, as we prepare for the birth of our child. And I was saying like, I'm really learning that I need to advocate for my needs because my fear is that when this child comes, there'll be no space for them at all. Cause dad falls to the back of the bus. <laughs> and the woman said to me, her name's Sarah Soleil. She said, well, perhaps you can see it that the family system is actually needing you to advocate for yourself. And the baby's actually preparing you to do that. So you can model it for, for the child. And I was like, Oh, wow, that's a brilliant perspective. So that way, there's also a little bit because we have to we have to have compassion for where the pattern comes from. So anyone who overfunks in relationship, learn that it's a survival strategy. It just doesn't work for a relationship with two adults in it. And if we operate that way, the other person also doesn't get to become an adult. Okay. So if there's any questions on that, let me know and we can hop into the situationship uh, resolution. No, I, I'm good with that because that that helps me again for my journey as a you know as a would be father. Yeah, so let's help the, some of these single people who get stuck yeah. in these situationships. Um, okay, so in these situationships, some of the red flags first are as if you notice that you are minimizing or changing what you actually want. A lot of the times when I work with someone, I'll say, "What do you want? Have you written it down?" And they'll say, "No." I know what I want. And I'm like, okay, tell me. And they don't know. They're not clear. And the reason you have to get very clear on what you actually desire and what you're looking for, even when you're swiping, is that you'll be intentional about what you're choosing. Now, listen, we've always been superficial relationally. That's not a new human behavior. It's just that Bumble and Tinder and these apps have amplified the superficiality. Yeah, amplified. Yes. Right. Like when you walk down the street, digit in your brain, you're throwing people, you're swiping left and swiping right all day. Right. All it's day. just that now it's it's become glaringly obvious that we are superficial. So it's not to demonize that. It's just to say, okay, well you're gonna desire you want to be in a relationship with someone you desire, of course. And if you're not specific about what you're looking for, you'll accept anything that says yes to you. A lot of the times when we're dating, we're actually waiting to be chosen by someone. We're not actually living in the energy of choosing. So I'm waiting for someone to finally say, I like you. I'm interested instead of do I like them? Like, am I interested in them? And this is a curse of things like uh, romantic comedies and Disney is this idea that one person's going to save the other person, right? Princess. Yeah. Well, well, by the way, isn't that, isn't that most of us in general life as well? We want to be chosen, you know, yeah. for, who are not living a fulfilled life, who are not, don't have a fulfilled career. It's like, why doesn't anyone see me? You know, I want to be chosen. Yes. Yeah, so please. Yeah. Continue. And, and I agree with the Disney stuff too. And what we see in romantic comedies, that narrative. Yeah. And so what that does is it, doesn't place us in the space of discernment to be in choice. And it this that adds to the narrative of the one, which if there's this idea that there's one person out there for you, and then you have a connection with someone, well, they instantly become the one. And so, so much weight rests on this person being the one that you can't be discerning anymore. And so you see, you're not like an adult when you're dating like that. You're dating as a child. Because you're not being discerning about, is this person safe? Is this person healthy? Can they communicate? And it's probably a similar experience to maybe how we relate to our parents or what we were modeled in relationship. Now, when someone says to me, but I have chemistry with them, I can't help it. I say, well, if chemistry is drawing you to people who are not healthy, then is it chemistry or is it wounding? Because Chemistry, if it's drawing you to people who are unhealthy, is actually inviting you to change who you choose. And what is inherent in that statement is that I don't get to choose what I move towards. But that actually is the powerful position is if you can say, if you could say no to what makes your loins tingle, 
and you actually end up directing yourself. So if you really want to, I don't care if someone wants a situation, just be fucking honest. Just have two people be honest about what they want. But often one person is lying. And a great red flag if you're looking for a relationship and the other person isn't is if they say, I'm not looking for commitment. They're telling you. But so many people don't hear that because they live in fantasy land that they're going to spend their life trying to be important enough that someone changes who they are, which is usually a pattern that we are trying to resolve from our childhood. But the, the change of that pattern is not to change someone else. It's actually to change how you relate to someone not being able to change. That's the shift. So that's why I don't even try to save someone from the pain of Valentine's Day. If someone says, oh, Valentine's Day is the worst. I hate it. I feel like shit. I'm like, why? Like, what is it about a day that celebrates love that actually takes you down, that it's actually powerful enough to make you feel that? I want to get to the root of the belief about relationships and your value that a day can rock you. Because to me, I'm like, it's just a day. And your value doesn't live in your relationship status. But of course, society would have you believe that you're more valuable if someone chooses you, much like we teach people that they're more valuable if they look young, much like we teach men that they're more valuable if they have more money or more power or more muscles. It's, you know, it's all part of the same system. And so to rebel against it is to reclaim your worth separate from all those things, much like you said about or, you know, am I, do I feel valuable in my work? Do I feel lost? Right. It's a similar thing. Okay. Kelsey, if you have anything else, I have so anything, many, I have so many really? thoughts. All right, let's go. Cause, cause well, you know what? It's Valentine's day. It's Valentine's day. Okay. Going back to the chemistry or the wounding thing that like, oh my gosh, I can think of like, I'm thinking of one person in particular in my life, like right now that I'm like, oh my God, yeah, it's so wounding. So it was wound, able, it's your wounding that attracts you to him. Right. Not it's the not chemistry. chemistry it's wounding. Yes. Right. And so like, okay. And wounding once, is sexy. Let me get. It's yeah, the ultimate okay, test. What? It usually comes covered in coconut oil. You know, it's yeah. like, it does. Because we're usually drawn to the thing that's almost it, but not. And that's the test. Oh. Especially okay. because we often treat the pain of not being chosen with arousal. So that's where situationships actually become addictive because we get addicted to the experience of arousal that treats the pain of abandonment and rejection, if that makes sense. Yes. So you, and it's almost like chasing that high where it's like, you want to change that. You're like, no, choose me, choose me. And then because they're so not, like and you're not choosing yourself. So you're inherently in pain. It's a, like, if you choose to be in a relationship yeah. that is not in alignment with you and is not in service of what you actually desire, you will be in psychological pain. You'll probably be anxious. You might be depressed. You might have autoimmune, like all these things are all correlated. And if you don't, if you, if you choose to stay in those, then what can treat the arousal of it on top of, or sorry, treat the pain of it on top of drugs, alcohol, you know, getting addicted to your phone is arousal. You get a high from experiencing orgasm or, you know, all that stuff. And so it actually treats the pain of existing in a situation that's not in alignment with what you actually want. Okay, so then for people who don't want to necessarily be in situationships and they actually want to like, commit to someone how do you live in a world that I feel like especially in LA and I, I hate saying this because it's like you, you get what you say right I'm like LA LA dating sucks like I'm gonna get that then but I feel like so many people in this city just do want situationships so then like how do you go about dating and not get that well you declare what you want early you know a lot of the times we're afraid that if I declare what I want they might not want what I want. Well, that's actually the whole purpose. <laughs> that's the mind fuck of it all is like, if you actually say what you want and they're like, I don't want that, that's the filter, you know? So by declaring it and by saying it and by saying no to what isn't, you actually put yourself in the space to be available. You're right though. You know, if, it, it doesn't mean that 85% of the people we meet can't be into situationships. And so it's validating this belief because everyone I know from LA Tends, a lot of people I know from LA tend to say that people from New York and we're talking about some of the most populated cities, you know, which if you were just kind of even bad at math, you could disprove that. Like, I'm sure, you know, people in relationships who live in LA who are really happy and in love who met in LA, 
So it's very similar. It's like, if you believe that everyone's into situationships, you will continue to only see that. But if you say no to situationships, now your attention is directed at finding people that are looking for that. And instead of being on a Saturday night with this other person who's not looking for what you're looking for, you're actually available. And that's actually how fast our lives change. You could be in line at a Starbucks that instead of being getting a booty call, and all of a sudden you're at Starbucks and you're in line and some guy's are like, hey, what's up? You know, want a banana nut muffin? Which that sounds bad, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Totally. So it's, do you feel like there's a lot of energy there where it's like, my mom, this is my mother's tip from the other day. She was like, Kelsey, maybe if you stop giving like all the douchebags your energy, then it will actually create space for the other. And so do you think 100%. that there is? percent. Yeah. yeah. Think about this. If I say no to being in those circumstances, I completely shift where I physically am. Like, think about that. You got to imagine it. Even if you don't believe in this, just think about this. The message you send to the universe by f messing around with those people is that you actually don't believe you can have what you desire. So you have to believe that about yourself. So the moment you start choosing yourself and start choosing and trusting, then you actually start to cultivate a belief that you're worthy of that. You're no longer waiting to be chosen by someone. You're actually actively choosing yourself. And then what happens in the dating process is you're no longer seeking for a wound to be healed. You're actually operating from wholeness, seeking to find someone who is also doing that. Eventually, that shit just becomes a red flag. Like you don't even care about unavailability because you see how toxic it is to your own self and beliefs. So yes, absolutely. You think about just like from a physics level, like you can't be in two places at once. And maybe God, the universe, whatever, is waiting for us to figure our shit out. So we can, and so we're going to keep bumping into douchebags so we can be like, no. And then all of a sudden someone else shows up. But you have to learn to say no to what is unhealthy to even be able to enter healthy. I remember working with this person who was in a relationship with a very toxic person. And I remember saying to her, are you gonna, like, what are you gonna do? And she was like, well, here, I'm gonna stay with him until I meet someone who's better, like Ooh. who's a good guy. And I was like, that good guy is gonna walk right by you. Because one, he's not going to be interested in a woman in a relationship. And two, he's not going to be interested in someone who's still in a pattern where they tolerate bullshit. Because when someone really wants to be in a relationship with someone, they want someone who will stand up to them as well. You know, there's a great book, line in the book from Robert Glover called No More Mr. Nice Guy, where he says, if you don't stand up to her, she won't believe you'll stand up for her. And it's very similar in, in regardless of your gender. If you are overtly a doormat, people won't trust you because your kindness is contrived. Your kindness is contrived. Wow. Yeah, because it's to get something. It's not genuine. It's a survival strategy, wow. which is healthy, right? Like from a, from a survival perspective, that's good. But from an adulting relationship perspective, they won't trust you because your word isn't actually real. It's manipulative. I'm writing this down. <laughs> I literally, I'm like, I need Mark in my pocket for every scenario that I'm like comes into my life. So do you think that, that even the kindness being contrived, do you think that for people who are always trying to help other people for that maybe same reason for whatever emotional needs or shortcomings they have, that's why maybe people don't trust it sometimes? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, like when, when we operate from that place of overfunctioning, look at, Anyone who's in service work generally, like doctors, nurses, massage therapists, physiotherapists, coaches, uh, like any of those worlds, generally we go into them because we care about people. So this isn't about not caring about people. It's that what happens is, is we're really monetizing our superpower, which is being able to support people. But there has to be a line where we end and other people begin, right? Like where there's a boundary to the amount of giving. As soon as we start giving and emptying our own cup, then we're leaving ourselves, right? Like we're, I'm, I'm prioritizing other people over me. And in relationship, 
in attachment theory, there's, you know, we don't have to get into the depths of attachment theory, but what happens is, is that people who constantly chase and chase and chase, they are not comfortable being on their own. They don't know how to self-regulate, right? They don't have to be with their own feelings. People who run from love don't know how to co-regulate, be with other people, how to sit with other people in their feelings. And so this is what really, you know, that's why the nervous system is so much correlated to all of this stuff, which the nervous system is a whole other layer in yeah, conversation. It is. Beautiful it's, one. It's, it's another part. But as you heal these things, that's why choosing someone who's unavailable, actually starting to choose availability is about increasing our capacity for being alone as we move towards someone who's healthy. We often take the hit of the person who's just going to give us a bit because we don't know how to sit in the space. We Our capacity for our nervous system to self-regulate is lower, if that makes sense. It does. That's why someone so, who runs from love, who tends to be in relationship with the people who chase it, uh, which, you know, like my partner is more prone to avoidance. I'm more prone to anxiety, to the chasing. She's more prone to distancing. They have to learn how to be with other people's feelings without feeling like they're going to lose themselves, you know, because that's usually the pattern they learn as kids. All right, Kelsey, are you ready now for your Valentine's Day? <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. No, I love this. I think I really like hearing these things and I'm like, Oh, yep. I'm doing that. Oh, there's my problem because I'm like, I want to fix it. I want to like dive into that. So, I mean, even I know we went away from it, Mark, but even going back to the chemistry versus wounding, cause that's still blowing my yeah. mind. Um, if I have now, if I'm like able to be aware of it, is that just part of the healing or like, is, are there additional things I need to do to then go in and be like, okay, besides therapy and X, Y, and Z. Well, yeah, you know, there's a saying from Abraham Hicks that uh, words don't teach, teach actions do. Mm. So you can know all of this, which actually, if memory serves me correctly, you were aware of some of these patterns previously. Yeah, probably. Yes, I was. <laughs> so you are aware of it, but there's mm. a limitation to changing it. And so having someone, you know, who you are working with, who's holding you accountable to transformation, but you got to find something that matters to you more than your wounds. You know, like if you look mm -hmm. at the thing you most want to create in your life, you know, like, just think about that. What is the one thing that you most want to create in your life? And if it's relationship, which it usually is for most people, some people it's purpose, you know, or, or work or creating a business, but most people it's relationship. You have to tap into that. You have to tap in to that power because if that's what you want to create, it's not going to allow you to keep behaviors that you're aware are not healthy. So really transformation occurs when we make a different choice. You know, and I made a rule a long time ago that I would always live at my highest level of knowledge. That the moment I learn something, I have to change because it's no longer healthy. And so it's no longer even a mistake. It becomes a choice. So now you can't consciously put yourself in a relationship or in an experience with a toxic person or a douchebag or whatever, because you know that you're exposing your soul to something that is not healthy or productive towards what you want to move in the direction of what you want to move towards. And if you can sit with the absolute reality of that, the depth of the pain of that awareness, if you do it, that significant pain that comes from that, then you realize like, wait, I can't let myself do that anymore. And you know, I remember when I had the awareness that I was in relationship with people who didn't want to fully choose me. I remember just having this moment working with a psychotherapist where I was like, man, I just grieved. I started crying because I was like somewhere I learned that this was actually normal. And I just remember being so sad for me, like for a little me, because I was like that. And I just grieved it. But what was in that grief was also very healthy rage, like sacred anger, sacred rage that was like never again. And that from that day forward, my boundaries became so fucking solid for that, that I was like never. And we have to do that not just with other people, but with ourselves. 
And that is, that's, you could feel that it's somatic. It's in your gut. You think about all the people who overfunction, take care of everyone. Their life is about everyone's needs. When they finally say no, all that energy that has gone into everyone else, all that life force is now in their own body. And it can go towards healing. It can go towards boundaries. It can go towards transformation. But ultimately what's happening every time we're relating, no matter the relationship type, is we are asking ourselves, one, is this relationship safe to be me? And two, do I have my own back? And most of us don't have our own back. So maybe now Valentine's you, Day can be the now day. Now I'm going to cry. Back. Well, when you, you know, when you went to your childhood um, and that helped you to realize so much about what you do today, I'm fascinated by that because of our show. What I struggle with is I can point out to Kelsey moments in her childhood and to Maria that seem as though they affect their present day decisions. But for whatever reason, especially with Maria, it doesn't seem to resonate. They have to get there on their seat on their own. That's what's I find the struggle. Like you probably, Mark, if Kelsey and me told you about our childhood, you would easily say, oh, well, <laughs> that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you're, you're probably X, Y and Z. But I find it hard when I'm, you know, working with people I care about. It's 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 hard for them to get to that moment, to see the correlation between what went on in their childhood and the choices they're making today. Yeah, often um, we would pair with someone who's more avoidant. Avoidant people don't tend to move towards that information on their own initially. Um, so being pointed to it is also being pointed to a pattern potentially that they're just not ready to see. You have to accept first that you have a pattern that's unhealthy. To even find the pathology of anything, you have to actually be able to label what's really going on. You know, so if like I said to my partner, oh, I see why you do that, it's from your childhood. She's like, I don't do that. You know, like that yeah. there's not even <laughs> gonna be a willingness to witness it. So there has to be almost like uh, an experience of consent of the exploration, you know, and instead of me maybe labeling it because, you know, sometimes I can make an assumption about where something comes from and I'm totally wrong. And, and instead of being, you know, which I love if I try to label something and someone says, Nope, that's not right. Because that's true for them, right? They're being discerning about the pathology or where something comes from. Um, but if you can both curiously be willing to look towards the pattern and they get to be, especially for someone who's avoidant, they get to be in the driver's seat of the exploration of that and they're willing to, um, then you have a more openness, if that makes sense. Got it. Happy. Yeah, because they might be like, Valentine's that doesn't feel Day. right. What's that? I said happy, happy freak. freaking Valentine's Day. <laughs> no, but I think it is because I think it's all, no, this, all this stuff excited. just moves us forward. Mm -hmm. Change our patterns, you know, like what is more exhausting than having the same challenge in relationship? It's like at least get creative, have new challenges, you know, and every time you heal something, you just up level. And that's why relationship as a vehicle for transformation and let's say the ultimate goal of human uh, being a human, a human existence is self-actualization. The fastest way to achieve self-actualization is through relationship because you'll never have a more powerful mirror to your inadequacies, to your limitations. And we mostly get defensive about that, but that is actually a gift. That is actually a beautiful gift if we're willing to, to receive it. I'm writing that down. The fastest way to self-actualization is through relationships. Now, that is so counterintuitive to what I would have thought because I would have thought self-actualization is something you need to get to on your own and you can't depend on other people to get there. But what you say makes perfect sense because you learn in your relationships and like you said, the relationship is a mirror, you know, for what we want, what we, who we are. Wow. So, so much for trying to be, become self-actualized and not have relationships. <laughs> you can't. You can't. You at least will have to do it through the experience of relationship. It's also like when someone's single and they think they got their poop in a group and then they start dating and they're like, oh, shit, I thought I healed that. Well, 
you can grow absolutely individually on your own. There's no doubt. Um, but you know, all, I would say all our wounds occur in relationship and they need to be healed that way. You know, I can build the baddest ass boundaries on my own, but as soon as I enter relationship and my needs bump up to someone else's and we have to learn how to negotiate, that's when you really learn. Do you have good boundaries? Can you communicate? How do you receive boundaries? You know, how do you stand? Again, that, that question we're always asking ourselves, is it safe to be me? Do I have my own back? And we want to cultivate relationships that it's safe for the other person to be themselves too. Often we're very self-oriented in relationship, but can we create a sacred space between us and other that actually honors two individuals and celebrates two individuals and makes it that two individuals still exist in the container of relationship. We often think it's romantic to lose ourselves. There's nothing romantic about losing yourself. It's codependent, you know, and, and most of us end up breaking up later in our lives because we realize we don't have a self. And so we think the relationship is to blame for not having a self. And sometimes it is, uh, but ultimately it's that we haven't claimed ourselves in relationship. Okay. So, Mark Groves, where do we find you? We need to have all the stuff, all Mark Groves, so we can continue to have more of this. <laughs> By the way, you just gave us so much. It's hard to put all this into practice. So I do recommend writing. I always recommend taking notes like I did or re-listening to these episodes, but definitely hearing more from you, Mark. Where else can we find you and all this amazing information? Well, one, thanks for having me again. I'm always excited always. to come on the show. Um and happy to do a Q and A sometime if that is helpful for. Would people. love that. Yes. Um, just so we can do real time chatting and coaching. Um, and you can find me. I have a Mark Groves podcast. I have Create the Love on Instagram. Um, I have CreateTheLove.com where all my courses are. And uh, yeah, you can Google my name. And, and the courses the are. To, what are those? What, what will I yield if I take those courses? So I have one called Dating 101 that, oh, it's badass. It's, it will take you through from start to, you know, the why you choose who you choose, where it comes from, what do you actually want to create. It'll help you learn about your nervous system and how to heal it in the process of dating. And it's how to make dating a fun experience, you know, to actually make it so it's a healing process, a, a process where you find your power. Um, and so that's called dating 101. I have another one called the breakup recovery course. And that's all about just healing oh, from very breakup important. and closing the door. Yeah. Like yeah. actually using breakups as a vehicle for complete transformation, because I don't actually know a more potent vehicle for transformation than heartbreak. It's funny. I have two friends who experienced a terrible breakup a couple of years ago and one has used it to grow and the other one has not. And uh, I mean, I'm going to recommend this. Mark, thank okay. you so much. Thanks and we definitely me. would love to have you back on because there's other things to explore as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks thank you, Mark. Me. Good luck with your little Pisces baby. And that was the great Mark Groves wow. helping my relationship, who's in a relationship, you, Kelsey, who so much. is pursuing relationships, sort of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, a lot of great takeaway there and certainly stuff on our regular guy Friday show that we, we need to go even deeper on because um, yeah, I've got, as always, I'm in class too, everyone. These are all my notes. Oh, same. I have pages over here. You know, so yeah, so, we will need to yeah. unpack for sure. Sometimes Kevin. it's like, you know, guests see me writing and they go, wait, wait, what are you doing? And you're giving me such good information I need for my own life. Yes. I want it for the fans too, but I need this for me. I know. I felt bad. I kept turning and writing and I was like, I hope he knows I'm literally writing notes from him. Sometimes I think they think we're making show notes, but no, I'm Oh, no, actually, no. <laughs> these, <laughs> these are like my therapy notes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really. So anyway, I think uh, hopefully there's a lot of great stuff in there and there's more to come with him. We will definitely interview him again. But in the meantime, um, you know, what is it? Make good choices. Be nice people. Make good choices. And? And be Present. present and you know what have a great valentine day and remember you That's do right. not need to be in a relationship to enjoy this day this is about love so it, whether it's parents or friends or other people you can let them know today and by the way it's about self-love too so it's about you too so 
go and do something nice for yourself. Screw it. Honestly, you know what? If if you know if you feel a little down, if all this holiday stuff has you in a in a twist, so to speak. Uh, no, you got to just take the needle off the record and go. No, you know what? It's about love, and I'm gonna love me, and so I'm I'ma do this blank. I'ma spa. I'm a shop. Why, Kelsey? My why do you be like done. that? I'm, no, I I'm love that, it. I, that's why the kids love me because I'm down. I know. I'm having a Galentine's Day date with my friend Kimberly. We're gonna get you some nails. Look at you. Exactly. See? That's what it's about. All right, you guys. Take care. See you tomorrow on Kill Squad. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. Program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menunos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menunos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.